Boom. All right. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you for um, attending our webinar today where we're going to take a closer look at Creo Simulate. Um, this is a tremendous tool. I mean, when, when you're designing a product, you know, a lot of times designers and engineers can think more about form or fit and not function. And Creo Simulate helps you to be able to design for function early and often in the design stage. And next week we'll be, we'll have a webinar looking at um, some of the Creo Ansys tools, which assist in that as well. But um, before there were tools with Cre with Ansys, there was Creo Simulate, and it's a tremendous tool, and it's really versatile. And it's once again, it's made for a designer or an engineer to be able to um, help design for function. And we're going to show that today. And Paul Dye, a solutions consultant and applications engineer with the Virtual Center of Excellence, is going to lead the presentation and the demonstration today. So, Paul, take it away. But how long we got, Paul? Uh, we'll definitely be down under 20 minutes today. 20 minutes, not bad. Good deal. So if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A, and we'll try to answer them as we go. Paul, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Rob. And thank you, everybody else, for hopping on today. So again, my name is Paul <laughs> Dye, Solutions Consultant here with BTC, and really happy to be going through and talking around Creo Simulate. Like Rob mentioned, we have multiple different solutions in Creo when it comes to simulation, whether it be in two specific areas of manufacturing or the ANSYS tools, but really whenever it comes to maturity and the amount of capabilities that you're working with, there's really nothing that stands up to what we have here in the Creo Simulate tools. So I'll go through and explain exactly what we're covering there. And I wanna start off just by going over some of the main challenges that we typically see people go through whenever it comes to working with simulation, especially whenever it comes to in the design process, right? And it's typically something that you would imagine experts really only doing, not something that someone that's working as a designer could manage, right? As a designer, maybe you just want to make your parts and send them off to the analyst and be done. It becomes more of a process of I create the model and someone else tells me if it's going to work or not. And it should be more of a collaboration. It should be more working towards an ideal design rather than just working with it as a pass or fail, right? If a, simple, if a part simply just passes, it's likely to underperform or cost more money in the long run. And, and whenever you get to analysis, it's typically done much too far into the design process. Something would fail at analysis it, and it's done only once the design's finished, it could be cost a lot of money or a lot of time and effort to run back through. It would be a lot better if we could incorporate that more into the process and still have the same abilities to validate on the design and make sure that it's good to go out for manufacturing, but still improve the design all the meanwhile. And this is really what Creo Simulate allows us to do. This is PTC's traditional analysis tools for taking the things that we're designing and truly starting to understand the changes that we're making while we're making them and really help to find the best possible solution at the end of the day. So things like structural thermos, thermal vibrational analysis tools, helping us to truly understand how our models are performing and beginning to work more towards an optimal solution. And one of the greatest things about this is the fact that it's integrated seamlessly in with Creo Parametric. It's just a click away and really starting to change our mindset whenever it comes to working with these types of tools throughout the design process and starting to involve simulation much earlier on and still have at the same time the ability to run the validation uh, simulations towards the end of the process. So we still have that pass or fail mindset that we can go through and work with, but instead we're really working more towards a, an optimal design throughout that as well and help us to make those decisions earlier on and ultimately get to better solutions ultimately. What this starts with first and foremost is the ability to run optimization and feasibility studies. First, you wanna know, is your design something that's possible? Is it something that you wanna keep working with? And then if so, which variables or dimensions can I change to maximize say on something like strength, but minimize on the weight that we have to get there? And what we've done really is build up simulate with the designer in mind. We don't want a designer, someone that's working in Creo to build something and simply hoping that it works. We want those designers to create a model and 
really understand that it is the correct design. And we have a very full suite of capabilities here within Simulate. You can see it's everything from structural static analysis, buckling, thermal analysis, even into nonlinear materials. Uh, material nonlinearity is something we work with a lot. Uh, isotropic and composite materials, this is something that you want to be able to take into account. Large deformations, pre-stresses, dynamic analysis, even into nonlinear thermal. That's another area this plays into. And I'll break down a little bit in a second exactly where you're getting access into all these different capabilities. Uh, another kind of dirty word I'd say that we run into a lot of times whenever you think about simulation is meshing, something that analysts tend to keep to themselves. They have their own little world where they go through and build out meshes, and that's completely fine, right? Creo is all about automatic meshing. What Chris Creo and that system is able to do is build out the optimal mesh for you so you don't have to. And if you really do want to, you do have the ability to override the system, and you can still have full control over the mesh, but you're able to really let Creo do that work for you. And this works for solid geometry. It also works for shells, springs, beams, those different types of idealization. Those are all things that are built into simulate as well. And one of the other things I want to mention is the fact that we really want to be utilizing things like feasibility and optimization studies early and often throughout that design process, not only in our late stage prototypes, but also in our alpha and our beta designs. Sensitivity studies really help us in that process, help to figure out what properties, whatever we change, either have or don't have an effect on the values that we care about. And you can try out lots of different what if scenarios and gain a much deeper understanding of the product or the model that you're working with there. All right, and from this point, you have a lot of functionality whenever it comes to observing the results. Automatically simulate will build out templates that give you information on stress, displacement, many other values. This can be output into many different file formats from Excel, HTML, VRML. You can query on certain results. You start to see exactly what certain uh, values like stress would look like, how exactly parts are gonna deform. You could use animations for that. And then plotting information as well to observe, to, to provide for others, detailing how the part's gonna deform. That's all been designed to be easy to work with, easy to share out and collaborate with others. And here what you can see is a quick breakdown into exactly what we have in terms of the different options around Creo Simulate. Now, by default with Creo Parametric, you do have some available capabilities just right out of the box. And this is a really good opportunity to go through and try this tool out. Gives you the ability to do some standard structural analysis and do that on parts and assemblies. Essentially just going to be limited by the size of the model and the number of surfaces that you have from within that model. And from there, working with really the standard capabilities is where we would move to the simulate extension. This starts to include things like buckling analysis, thermal analysis, um, working into different idealizations and optimization. And from that point, if you really want to take in the full sco scope of this tool and be able to take this to the next level and understand fully how your models are performing, we would work with the Creo Simulate advanced option. This is starting to take into all these different options that we have from nonlinearity, uh, isotropic and composite materials, large deformations, dynamic analyses. If you really want to understand how those models are performing, that's where you would take it into the Creo Simulate advanced option. But a few different options depending on exactly what you want to focus in on. All right, now I'll go ahead and move into a demonstration so we can see what this would actually look like from within the context of Creo. Again, if you have any questions or you want me to explain anything any further, feel free to drop that in the chat box and I can definitely take that once we go through here. And now we're gonna be working over here in our Creo environment. In our case here, we have a machine press here that's held together by a metal frame. And on this metal frame, we have brackets up in the corners that probably are gonna allow us to mount this maybe over in the shop, wherever we're working with this. We've used this particular bracket in another design, but I haven't necessarily used it in this new context that we're gonna use it in. We need to make sure it's gonna work and we'll use Creo Simulate to do that. So here we have that older design, you know, some good geometry built out, but we wanna make some changes. And again, the entire interface is right here from within Creo, so where we can go through and lay out our constraints, our loads, our materials, and a lot of other options around that. First thing I'll do is lay out some constraints. In my case, I know which edges that we want to be welded down. That's where we're going to hold that part. And next we can apply some loads. 
In this case, the load's going to be on these holes where the attachments are going to go or where they're going to be placed. In my case, I know that I want this to be a point load to simulate more of a torsional load. The weight's going to provide more of a twisting force, so we can lay that out here. And that's where we can go through and define exactly how that's going to be affected, what force components that we want to lay out there, and we can get a preview of what that's going to look like right there on our model. Okay, now that I've applied my load to my constraints, we can go ahead and lay those out here in my study. You have different options depending on what you want to run for static, modal, for vibrations, buckling, fatigue. In this case, I want to apply a static load. We'll use the constraints that we made, we we'll use the loads, and there's a few different ways that we could do this. We could do it as a single pass study. In this case, I want to do it with a multi pass to get within a certain level of accuracy for that study. And now simulate will run through each of the passes here to get within that level of accuracy that we're looking for. In this case, it's a pretty simple case. It doesn't take very long to go through. And we can see now that that analysis is complete and we can check out the results for the study. And this is going to bring us up a template, first giving me an animation of the displacement and different options for what we want to plot out on the part. I can see that in my case, I have a stress value of around 19,000 PSI. And in my experience, I know that that's too much for this particular part and needs to be changed. Now, what we can do is take that information and take a look back at the plate here. Maybe I want to go through and modify it. I have some initial ideas to possibly make it thicker. But at the same time, if you're concerned with weight and you want to keep that down, uh, that's something you need to take into account and something that we can test out here in our sensitivity study. What we'd essentially be doing with this is run the analysis, but whenever it runs, we want to change something. In my case, I know I had a high stress in this filleted region. I want to understand what happens as I change the radius there. And now the difference is instead of me, the designer, having to iterate through those values, I can just tell the system to do it within a particular range. And what we'll do is rerun that study and see what the system will feed out for us. I can also choose to get a graph of the values here. In this case, I'm interested in seeing how our von, Mies, our von Mises stresses are changing. And what I can see is visually, as I'm changing the filler radius, what stress values are going to result from that. We can get a visual representation of that along here. We can see that they get to what we might want around 11,000 PSI. I'd have to get to a radius of around 0.4, so double what we had before. And from that point, we have options. I could choose to then go back into the part, change it. I could let the system give me the exact value for the use case that I laid out. And now from here, I don't want to simply just make the part thicker. I want to minimize on the, on the mass of the part. Now to do that, I would lay out an optimization study. And with an optimization study, we need to define limits. Like before, I know that I can't have stress values above 11,000 PSI. I'll add that in here. Let's go through and select that right here from our list of measures. Our maximum von Mises stress and just type in the values for that. And from there, we could have more than just one. I know that I'm worried about the bracket warping. I want to put a range on our maximum displacement. Go ahead and select that and say that it can't go above 0 0.0015 inches. And now I have a few different design limits laid out that I don't want the study to exceed. We'll then add in some variables that the system can use. We'll include in a range for the fillet size. And what I can do from now is just have the system go and try to find the optimal radius that matches our limits. But as you can see, there's a lot of other things that we could utilize here. I could tell the system that we can change certain things around the height of certain components of our bracket. We could take an overall width here, take the length of the bracket, could be the thickness, whatever you want to go through and lay out here. All these things, if I wanted to figure out manually, would take me hour and hours to even figure out a piece of what we're working with here. And the idea is now that we're not taking and using all that time, right? Instead, we just want to simply use our, our spreadsheet down here to enter in the bounds for the study. I know how big a certain tab can be. I know that the fillet has to be a certain radius or a certain measure. We know that angles can go maybe up to 90 degrees in this case. All these different parameters that I want to study but I want the system to do all of the tedious work for me. So again, looking back at the process, we're first and foremost telling the system what our design goal is. In this case, we want to minimize the mass. 
Secondly, we're telling the system the bounds for the study, exactly how high or low each value can go. And then finally, say what dimensions or variables that the system can utilize in the study. If we were gonna manually try to do all that in the, our design, it would take entirely too long to accomplish. But what we can see now is we just tell the system what we want. It goes through, tries out those different designs, checking to see if the design limits are satisfied. Also checking to see whether we're getting closer to a moving away from those limits. And then once the system gets within the values and the limits that we set, we're good to go. And now we can check out the optimized design. And here we're viewing that design, clearly going to be a lot different from what we had before. Obviously, the fillet size increased, the tab size decreased, and at the same time, it was able to reduce the mass as much as possible. One thing that we're able to do with this as well is go back and review some of the steps that we took towards getting to this design. You can see with each step exactly what that study did right on top of the model. It lowered the tab height, increased the affiliate radius, keep shrinking the part, but still maintaining all the structural requirements that we need for that bracket. All right, that's how we want to really be utilizing Creo Simulate. So not only looking to get a pass or fail out of the model, but looking to get to the best possible model, something that goes beyond just the simple requirements that we had laid out for it initially. All right, so with that, a lot of really great capabilities there and really giving us a lot of value throughout that process as well that we're able to work with. It's really valuable for companies that are looking to improve their products. We can do that in a number of different ways. First, by cutting down the amount of rework they need to do. You're able to work with this in Creo much earlier on in the process. You don't have to go through and build out as many prototypes, which can oftentimes be very costly. And you can do this type of uh, optimization much further um, earlier on in the process, help us figure out what's essential to our design, what can be removed there as well. And also overall, lower life cycle cost. If you can catch flaws earlier on in the design process, they're not showing up in prototype phases. Even worse, if you had a problem that would show up post-production, you have a recall. This is just another layer of protection against something like that. Much more easy and much more quickly and effective to get our products out to market. Use it early and often. Yes, sir. All right, and with that, that's cool. all I had to go through and share today. So I can pass awesome. it over to you, Rob. Well, thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. So I have a poll I'm going to ask everybody. There's a couple of questions on this poll. I want to see if everybody can like answer it. So have a little Super Bowl fun. You got to have a little fun in your life, right? So who will win the Super Bowl? Will it be the Philadelphia Eagles or will it be the Kansas City Chiefs? That's question number one. Question number two is which Super Bowl coach do you think won a punt passing kick competition as a youth? And lastly, which Kelsey brother is the coolest? Is it Jason? Is it Travis? Or is it their mother? Even though the mother's not a brother, but I think it's actually kind of fun. I'm offended that the hosts and panelists can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I that apologize for that. That's too much. You knew that I'm a Chiefs fan. Oh, really? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm rooting for the Eagles with this one, I think. I have some family that nice. I'm going to be rooting for them with. We'll, we'll take it. Hey, Paul, when we had, when we had, I'm actually going to stop the recording here because we're getting silly. Um, 